people can join. We probably have a, a, at least two to three minutes before we get started if you need to grab that last cup of coffee or the restroom. Virginia, is it possible to, to give me the ability to share my screen? Sorry about that, I am getting there. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Yes. start for we will start for certain at 934 I currently have 932 so at 934 we're going to get started thank you Virginia we'll go ahead and get started I see uh, Christine Steinberg is joined she'll switch over uh, Christine will be looking for you to join us in the main room here as we get started um, Welcome everybody, I'm Jacob Williams. I work for the Region 17 Comprehensive Center. Um, just gonna help us walk through the meeting today. <clears throat> We're gonna show you some red lines that have occurred in chapter six uh, that the task force is not has not yet fully agreed to, but uh, through conversation, it seems that uh, at this point, these adjustments are just formalities. And then we're gonna take a look at um, a chart uh, which demonstrates the changes being discussed within chapter four um, around licensing for teachers, the classroom teacher position, uh, and want to certainly get your feedback on those proposed changes as we look at those. So we're going to go ahead and start with chapter six. Uh, as we go through the day, we're a small group, so just feel free to jump in. If you have comments um, or anything that you see, I'm just gonna walk you through some of the context around these red line changes. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Myself, Julie, Crystal, who are on the call, uh, have been in these discussions, so we can provide some explanation uh, as to where we are. The first adjustment in chapter six is in 601, uh, specifically 601.2, 601 is around a request for discipline against the licensee. And if you look into, previously it read that the superintendent of public instruction may initiate a request to BPE for discipline if it was brought forth by uh, the local school district board of trustees or any other credible source. And the task force put forth to change that to be the board of trustees or the county superintendent. There was some concern that the ambiguity around any other credible source was a little bit too broad and they wanted to help ensure that any allegations could be brought forth uh, through a process of going through local channels first. Uh, with any other credible source, there was a possibility that the local level could be circumvented and someone could go directly to the the superintendent of public instruction really kind of denying someone that due process at the local level potentially. So they wanted to change that, change that language. The next change is in 601A, the definition of immoral contact, con, immoral conduct. Um, you will see it's in seven here. And this was a change really in response to the legalization of marijuana in Montana. So the, this language here that is redlined was taken out to make that change. And that, that came from the legal department at the Office of Public Instruction to make that adjustment, to make sure that it's in line with recent state law changes. Uh, the next change is in 601B, review. 
Uh, this was really put forth by Sharon Carroll, former member of the Board of Public Education. And it's just a clarification. It used to just read if the board, and it didn't really specify what board that was. So the change is now being made to say if the Board of Public Education in those two places to really clarify that it is the specific Board of Public Education in Montana. Next adjustment in six is in 607. And this is language around the appeal from denial and the changes in two, and it allows the written notice of appeal to be submitted via email or via post mail. Uh, previously, it could not be submitted via email and that came directly as a request of change from the board to allow those to be sent via email now. And that is where we are in chapter six. Anybody have any comments about any of those before I move past that? Okay, I'm gonna change over. Can everybody see this slide that's on the screen? Yes, I see. Christine shaking your head, thank you. I'm gonna open up a Google Doc. Mm -hmm. All right, so what you're looking at here is, um, you know, it, it's not listed with the current language of class, kind of class one, two, um, but we're, we're, we've, we've just adjusted for conversation purposes to kind of think about what's a provisional license and then what is the process of the advancing the license over time. So at this point, we're just kind of calling it the first tier license, your second tier license, and a third tier license. Um, as a task force, we're going to look at the specifics of language um, as we move forward, but this is where we are right now to just kind of help us keep, make sense of what we're talking about. We really view Chapter 57, we tried to drill down that the purpose of uh, the chapter itself is to help teachers obtain a license, keep a license, and advance a license. So in that method of thinking about obtaining a license and advancing a license, that's why we've tried to look at it in this horizontal chart as to what a progression could potentially could look like. <clears throat> and it's not uncommon now in many other states to refer to licensing in a tiered system as we refer to many things now in education as being tiered systems, but licensing uh, is also one. So we, we, we just use that language for our conversation purposes. <clears throat> and so if you'll allow me, I'm gonna walk you through what's happening in this chart. And then there are some very specific questions that I wanna ask about feedback to take back to the group as well. So in our conversation, I've had a chance to attend a couple of these feedback groups as well as in the task force. Um, there's been much conversation really in our provisional license uh, where the difficulty around people obtaining them and then also for teachers who may be coming from out of state with expired licenses and issues around those teachers specifically having to go back to school and obtain some college credit to get that, to get uh, a full license in Montana. So with the provisional license, here are some of the adjustments that we've made. So we're saying at this point in Montana, you can get a provisional license if you have a bachelor's degree and you're enrolled in a plan of study for completion of an educator preparation program. And that plan of study has you completing it within three years. And you've verified that you've completed the IEFA, the Indian Education for All course, which is offered through the OPI's online hub, right? So that's someone who lives in Montana. We've also put forth that you can get a provisional license if you're you have an expired teaching license. Most of the time, this may will be someone who may be coming from out of state. You complete, have verified completion of the IEFA course, and you have one of these options. So you have six hours of college credit within the fi past five years, which is what the current arm says, or you can demonstrate 60 hours of approved professional development activity within the past five years, or you have a passing score on the required praxis assessments, which would be pedagogy and content for the licensing where you're looking. So we're trying to add some different options for people to come in who may be coming in with that expired license to obtain a provisional license, not just having to go back to school and get the six hours of college credit as it's written now. 
there's also a clear path here if this person was to come in and get this provisional license um, and they were to pass that praxis that also grants them to move over into the first tier license within the next year because currently our first tier of license is written that someone has a bachelor's degree they verified the completion of the IEPA course and they've been through an educator preparation program uh, that includes appropriate supervised teaching experience. And that should be student teaching experience. Let me put that in there. And this is something that we're talking about still, one of the following. So it's a praxis, which is currently written, pass a praxis to get that first license, or if you happen to be on a provisional license, say for three years and demonstrate three years of teaching experience, you could have that in lieu of having to take the praxis to get this first tier license. The second option to get the first tier license would be a current standard teaching license, right? So meaning not provisional or an emergency license from another state in good standing and three or less years experience. <clears throat> hey, Jacob. Yep, please. Um, the three years of teaching, um, I don't know. I, I would just like to, I, I guess maybe add a word of successful teaching because I could have taught in three horrible situations and gotten fired from each one of them. Um, so something of a positive experience in three years of teaching. Mm -hmm. good, good point, Shay. So there is the language there that's without being placed on an improvement plan, um, okay. which I took from, which, which I took, it has come from another state. That is language yeah. that's used in the state of Minnesota with their license. So uh, the, the thing about successful, I think could be hard to quantify. No, I like what you have. I just didn't okay. see it as you were talking before. Thank you. Yeah, And I didn't mention it. So you're right. <laughs> but that, that is a good point. It, it is possible someone, uh, you know, Technically, you wouldn't be on an improvement plan if you were let go from three jobs in a row. But I think within the within the task force, there's been some discussion that uh, there there has to be some faith of uh, checks and balances at the local level, um, meaning that we wouldn't necessarily want our districts to be hiring teachers who had demonstrated that they were let go from two previous jobs. Um, but it's hard, sometimes it's hard to evolve and um, avoid those loopholes, right? So uh, I think if there's any additional language that we think could be put in there to help quantify that, that could be useful. I, I guess I'm trying to think through. So I'm coming in, I've completed an educator prep program. My license in another state has expired. So I've done the bachelor's degree. I've done the IEFA. I've completed an EPP. I've student taught. Now I don't have a current license. Do I have to do the praxis? So it's just interesting yeah, that we're singling you, out three years of teaching with a provisional license rather than just three years of teaching. I'm trying to figure out where that person would fall in. Well, that, that person would fall over here where they would need to, they would be eligible for a provisional license if they did one of these three things, not all three, but one of the three, if they could demonstrate it, right? Okay, so if I've they, already done those. Right. OK, so I've done my 60 hours of professional development. Do right. I still then have to do the praxis, even though I've been teaching, but I don't have a standard license? I'm just trying to figure out. I, I think I know where you were going with the provisional, that that counts as teaching experience. But right. if I have teaching experience, it was just a while ago. Right. Well, they, uh, at this point, and I see what you're saying, at this point, the way it's written is they would have to teach three years on a provisional license, and then they would be eligible uh, to, to move up. And so I hear what you, so what, what would be the suggestion? I just don't know why it just says three years teaching with a provisional license, why it wouldn't just be three years of teaching. It could be. I'm open to su suggestions. Anybody else have feedback on that? I just don't think, you know, as we're talking about, you know, people that maybe stopped out to have kids and are coming back in, it seems like a barrier that 
they're being put on a provisional license, even though they've technically shown recency, because right now they wouldn't have to be put on a, a provisional license, but this, this new tiered system puts those folks on a provisional license. I wonder if somebody might misuse just teaching, because if we do it with the provisional license uh, wording on there, then it has to be essentially teaching in a classroom kind of stuff. Whereas uh, I know like some of our students will come in and, oh yeah, I've been teaching at summer camps for three years. Right, but teaching is defined in 102 in definitions as experience, licensed experience in public or not public, accredited K-12 schools. So I'm just, I don't wanna penalize the person if they let their license lapse because they moved okay, it expired a year ago, but I taught for a while, we got settled here, but now you're telling me I'm only qualified for provisional. I just, I want to lay that scenario out. I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but I, I think that seems a little unfair. But would it fall under in that first tier where it says, or a current standard teaching license? Because if they did the things that were in the first column, wouldn't they have a standard license at that point? Well, they wouldn't because they would have a, they would still, they would be licensed initially under a uh, provisional license. Christine's making a point. Julie, have your hand up. Yeah, I think that um, Jacob, what the, what the question here and what um, folks are bringing up is this. So what this means you guys is um, the second part here. This is currently how rule is written. If you have an expired license and have done all of the pieces around the EFA course, um, gone through an EPP program, uh, done your student teaching, um, and your license is expired, currently your only option is to go back to college and take six hours of college credit in order for you to get your standard one or two license. And so that's what happens currently. They go to apply, they apply for a standard or a, a professional license, but because their license is expired, the option, the, the only, they get a provisional license for three years in order for them to get those credits there, to earn those six semester credits. And so the question has become at the task force is, is there other ways that they could reinstate their license uh, rather than just going back to school for six semester hours? Could they do it by um, getting 60 approved professional development units within those three years? Could they present the successful teaching as Shay had said um, within those three years? Um, so it's that they have to reinstate their license. And right now there's one pathway to do that. The, the task force is asking, are there other ways that they could do that within that three years? So could they do successful teaching for those three years or could they do 60 hours of approved professional development? So that's really what this is about here, if you will. I, I appreciate that, Julie, and that explanation, but I guess that's not how I read this because, so I understand that we need the recency component and that recency component now in the far left column can be met with renewal units or college credits. So that's not the part that I'm confused about, but I may have those recent credits. I mean, people often are doing other things. They may have those recent credits, but their out-of-state license is still expired. Now in the second column, they're not eligible for that stand or whatever we're calling the tier one license. I don't, I don't see how, even if they had recent, because their license from out of state is lapsed, I don't see how they would be eligible here for that. It almost seems like that um, the current license from another state now is becoming, it's actually becoming more restrictive because I have to then teach for three years instead of just getting recency credits. Does anyone else, uh, I'm, am I being too confusing? I'm just not I understand what I understand what you're saying, uh, 100%. And, and so essentially I could come in with 10 years experience, but I let my license lapse. And if I come into Montana, I am bound to work on a provisional certificate for three years, the way this is written. 
uh, before I could get a full certificate. And so the question is, how could we expedite someone who comes in with an expired license getting a full certificate? Yeah, without having to teach under the old one for three years. Right. Without having so to be Christina, for three Yeah, years. I see what you're saying. It's the first bullet is fine. It makes sense. Your license is expired. You're on the provisional for three years so that you can get those semester credits. And potentially the 60 hours is a potential option. But you're saying the three years is not a good option because quite frankly, they could have already had three years of experience. And then that means that if that's the case, then they should qualify or not qualify for the standard and professional is what I hear you saying. Yeah, because once you get those hours in, like it works right now, right? As soon as you get those either, and well, now it's six semester credits in the last five years. As soon as you get those taken care of, you're eligible for a tiered license. What we have listed on here doesn't allow that easy transition. Because I can see people who have an expired license getting those 60 hours before they ever apply. But how do they then move into one? I guess, I guess it reads as the praxis, right? That would be their only option. So could we put like, or completion of what I am now referring to as PL.1 <laughs> requirement? Something like that. So if you complete these requirements, then you're then you're eligible for. I guess I see it as praxis. I'm, so I, mean, I think the Jacob what... they could take the they could take the praxis. I mean that's the easy way out, right? Go past the praxis and you you can do it. Um, but. But currently, Jacob, how rule is written, and I'm not saying, so then we're talking about a change there. Currently, how, how rule is written is you have to take the praxis in the first place to even qualify for a provisional license. So it currently reads as an and up there. And I'm not saying that, um, you know, taking that or not taking that. I think the point is the way that this is written, um, that piece we have to somehow remove the three years of experience, right? And, and then that brings in a different point. If you're saying that they have to take the praxis, um, if they already have, they come with an expired license um, and they've already taken the, the praxis, does that automatically put them in a one or two? So what like we're it. saying is, the point we're trying to make here is if you have an expired license, what is it that they have to do to get to the standard or the professional within three years? So that kind of should come in earlier, right? So it's a pro appropriate student teaching experience. Then it's a current license, whether that's you know, a current out-of-state license. If you don't have the current out-of-state license, that's where the ORs probably come in, right? Because that would be the first thing you look for is do they have a current license? Um, okay, if you do, then maybe you are eligible for this. If you don't have a current out-of-state license, then we need praxis or experience or whatever the group decides that should be. So to me, maybe it's the ordering of what you're looking at in, in what order you know, sequentially. Mm -hmm. Because that resolves, Julie, what you're talking about is it's that, you know, they don't have recent stuff. And then the recent stuff could either be, I don't, whatever the committee decides, the praxis, three years on the provisional license, the 66 credits or 60 renewal units. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, Christine, what I hear you saying is really be crystal clear around that when we're talking about this provisional, it's for two different purposes. One is for folks who don't have the uh, EPP to get it. And the second purpose of the provisional is for folks um, who have an expired license, if you will. Well, would you, I mean, to, do you, not to stretch this too far, but do you do like you did with Praxis? you know, how you made the five, the five A, is there another license when it's only a recency issue? Just to separate it more, given that the provisional already, right, does cover both, both circumstances. 
it just has to be really clear and maybe maybe it's to distinguish them even further is to say one's a five one's a five a and one's a five b meaning the first one is for getting your epp the second one the five a is for completing your praxis but you have everything else and the third one is for you have everything except for you need to um, address your recency issue because you have an expired license. So it's, they're almost like different things, if you will. Yeah, and the, I mean, that would have to be crystal in your shop to determine if that makes it more complicated or not. <laughs> But I think that's the part that was throwing me off, though. If you, you know, should you really be penalized to that extent that you then have to teach to move to the next level, which we've never done, we never require teaching experience except to move right now to the class one, right? You could maintain a class two and never teach ever. And now it kind of is the, how this is worded. It looks like to even be in that, you have to have taught for three years you know, if your license expired. So just, uh, that was the only thing is just kind of think through that checklist when you're marking people off. Yeah. Do we solve that in some way, some of our difficulty by taking this out? Because that doesn't necessarily deal with the recency issue if they had a old practice score. And and just essentially we've, we've added the option of 60 hours of PD for that. And, and then they could get the license depending upon how many years experience they have if if we just added that stipulation of like completion of whatever we want to call this subsection right if they completed if they can demonstrate that they completed these requirements then they potentially could be eligible for you know any of the three if, if they had a master's degree and three or more years experience then they could be eligible for even like the, the third tier after they did one year on the provisional license so um, you guys kind of brought up a, a new point with this on the praxis scores. Some of those went through revisions um, on the scores and the accepted scores. And so do we need to put any language for somebody has, you know, passed a praxis in the past, but now their score wouldn't be valid? Or is that... Yeah, I think hey, we, this I, is Julie. We already have a rule in place that addresses that it grandfathers yeah. it in. Mm -hmm. Great. Kind of like um, uh, we have something where we could address that. I think it's on the endorsement. If it was an approved endorsement before, then it would need to be an approved, you know, score now. So okay. we could talk about that and we could be sure that's addressed. Okay. Thank you. So while we're here, I'm gonna go back to our provisional license that we have. Uh, it was put forth by um, really just one member of the task force uh, that only in the provisional license to have language that the plan of study that's enrolled in be Montana approved, which Julie can explain specifically what that means, but it means more than just accredited. It means it's approved by the state as an appropriate program, which is not a stipulation we have anywhere else. It in some ways eliminates the option for provisional licensees to enroll in some of the nationwide online programs, such as Western Governors. We really would like to get some feedback on that stipulation. Uh, this is Scott Kenny. I could speak to that a little bit. Please, Scott. Uh, in the last 16 years, I probably supervised over 12 uh, student teachers that have come through WGU. And WGU, I was just kind of running uh, numbers about every six months in the last couple of years. And they rough, have roughly 400 to 500 students from Montana enrolled. Uh, any given time. And I happen to really like their student teaching module and it's um, exceptionally well laid out. And 
it is, I had a situation where I had a, a certified teacher in Spanish and none of the bricks and mortar uh, entities in Montana offered ongoing math classes because she was interested in getting a math endorsement and everybody would give her an internship that re would require her to attend bricks and mortar during the summer which is was counter to what she wanted to do she she quit coaching so she could work uh, on classes during the year so what she ended up doing is enrolled in WGU and then it took two years for her but they do have um, synchronous classes throughout the school year for teachers and then it was kind of a cheesy deal but she got an internship with MSU she accrued all those hours and then um, it was uh, she was finally at, at the end of the day she was she was granted her uh, credential and she became somewhat of a unicorn because there aren't very many uh, foreign language math teachers running about. And so I was obviously uh, really um, involved in that whole process with her because she was, had so many roadblocks. And, and it was interesting because if you evaluated her transcript to this date, she's the only uh, high school and college student that had a 4.0 <laughs> in all of her preparatory work and it, it was just weird to me that uh, that OPI would put up roadblocks for you know such a, a successful academic who really was going to be helping us out and uh, the sad story continues that she left us after she got done she went to Kalispell for a lot more money <laughs> but um, that's why I've been always really concerned about WGU because it is uh, in my opinion, it's very valid and granted I support our geolocated schools as well, but not when it doesn't line up for teachers that need to take classes during the school year. So ends my sermon. You brought up a good point there, Scott, that, that was part of the conversation was that this Montana approved is currently language for the internship. Um, and then another point that I heard you say that was also brought up is aligned with that, um, there currently is an absence of flexible programs offered by the state institutions that could be beneficial for teachers who may be on the provisional license to get through their EPP within three years um, that, that, that are provided by some of the other programs such as Western Governors. So this could be very limiting by having that language in there. And you know, I represent a Montana EPP and, and I even I see problems with that. Um, you know, I, I wish we could serve everybody in every situation, but that's not always possible. Um, you know, the, the, the part about that is it provides a level of protection for the person under the provisional license, knowing that when they're done, they can actually get licensed here, right? So, you know, it's, it's a level of review that says, well, if we know if you complete a Montana program that you will definitely be able to get licensed because we all have to meet state standards. But if you do something through the ABC Blue Light Special, um, and if you don't know who they are, you should look them up. But if you did something through that, you may not be able to qualify for this. So that's the only thing, you know, that, that plays into that is it's a level of assurance for the, um, the applicant you know, the holder of the provisional license. But even from the EPP perspective, I understand why this language would be problematic. So Julie, question about this. If someone applies for a provisional license at that time of application, do they have to show the program that they're enrolled in? And then is there approval at that point that this program will be licensed by, Mon by Montana? And if not, is that something that could be built in to prevent the situation that Christine just put forth? Yeah, they, they complete a plan of study um, and they indicate on there uh, and then they then the uh, university uh, or the program where they're attending, if you will, signs off that the person is eligible and could complete the program within the time frame. But does, at the application, does OPI say 
yes, this program is a program that will grant you a license if you complete it. So that so that like someone doesn't in, doesn't present present a plan of study in a program that eventually at the end when it was reviewed, licensing could say, oh, sorry, we don't accept that program. Yeah, if it was not an accredited program, then uh, we wouldn't accept that plan of study up front. We would okay. send it back to them and say, you need to find an accredited uh, PPP that um, where you meet uh, eligible requirements to enroll and can complete your program within the time frame. Is that is that the concern that you just put forth, Christine? Would that address that kind of a checks and balance? Yeah. Well, this is Shelly Waite, and that's the same thing I was say, thinking. Instead of saying Montana approved, if it just said something about being approved by OPI, I think that's what all we would need in there. Which I think. I just want to be a quick, Jacob. We don't approve and accredit. Out, out of state EPPs. So um, it's about it being an approved accredited program uh, from its own state, not, not ours. So I just wanna be careful about that language. It's a nuance, if you will. But in chapter one, it does define what accredited is. Um, so if we just had the language here of a of an approved accredited EPP program, which would mean fell within the definition of accredited, there should not be issues, I think is what I hear people saying. Yeah, I agree with that. Thank you. That is very helpful uh, to take back to help for the conversation on Thursday, certainly. Um, next piece of conversation. Uh, if we look over into the second tier here of, of licensure, you'll see very similar. We have a bachelor's degree, complete the IEFA course, completion of an accredited EPP, um, the language about approved student teaching is is there essentially, but you need to have a current first year licensure and three or less years experience. Uh, and if you're, if you're coming from Montana, so this is really this first piece here is about language of a teacher who's working in Montana, wanting to advance their licensure. The task force has had much discussion uh, around having a stipulation that for all teachers who get their first license, essentially your first tier license, and for teachers who come from out of state with three or less years experience, that they complete some form of a Montana teacher mentorship program that would take place at the school. Uh, and essentially to advance out of that first tier, they would need to have demonstrated completion of that program, which does not yet exist, but there is, momentum to try and put that stipulation into chapter 57 um, with the idea that the program then would be created post hoc. The back and forth of that conversation has been putting it in in support of retention of teachers, giving them more support once they get that first license and to help them stay in the field. Uh, the counter to that has been putting another regulation on schools for something that they would have to build and implement? Uh, and is it another barrier for someone to advancing a license? And does it live in chapter 57 or is it more of a chapter 55 requirement around accreditation of schools uh, if it is going to be in the arm? We'd love to be able to take some feedback back to the group on that. Uh, what your thoughts are, does it live here? Uh, is it necessary in chapter 57? Is it useful? I'm sorry to talk so much, but I'm confused again um, between the one, the first tier and the second tier. And I guess maybe if you could just jump back and say, what is the rationale for the second tier? Because right out of my EPP, I could qualify for a first 
tier license, how long is that license? Because I could teach for five years and then where do I fall in second tier? Then I can move from first to third. So I'm just kind of confused for what's the rationale behind the second tier when it looks like the first tier is what I get right out of an EPP and that's when I would need mentorship. Right, uh, you're right. So the, the, the years are something we have to work out. That's a good point. The, the thing about not putting the mentorship in the first tier is essentially then someone would have to have a job before they could get the license because you would have to be enrolled in the mentorship to put, to put that in there. Does that make sense? So if I put it over here, essentially it would be not completion. I wouldn't have to complete it to get it. I'd have to be enrolled in it to get it. And then I'd have to have a job before I could get the license. So essentially it has to be marked as a completion of the program to advance. Um, and you're right about the years. I, I think that's a good point. How could we help that? Because someone could teach in the first year for five years but they'd have to have their masters to, Which isn't hard to, do. to move over. And so then, I mean, if you did that, you could skip this. You could potentially skip that altogether. You're right. Right. So but, then, it, but it, then it begs the question, what was the intent of the second tier? At this point, it's only there to house this mentorship piece and to try to get it to, to fit in there. Uh, and, it, and since it's a retention purpose. If someone did stay for five years in this first license and get a master's, then they've demonstrated that they're retaining in the classroom. So the mentorship piece didn't, didn't hold point, but that, I mean, that's the conversation is it's, it is unclear how to fit that in. Uh, and at this point, the way to fit it in is to sort of add this piece. Um, and is it a good fit for this at all? Really? Well, so if someone keeps the first tier license, what, I, I guess I don't see the benefit of going to the second tier or what does that do for a person to go to the different tier of license? Um, Julie, can you speak to that? Would there, would we envision a pay bump? Is there now between the classes? That's, that's another great question. No, there's no pay difference for folks, yeah. uh, depending on which of these tiers that they're in, if you will. Um, I think that Jacob, going back to um, Christine's direct question, right? She asked, what's, what's the purpose of the second tier, right? And so I think what Jacob's trying to show here is this piece around um, completion of a Montana teacher mentorship program. So what the task force has been talking about, if you will, and considering is, is that everybody would come in on a kind of provisional license. Um, I don't, I don't want to call it provisional because it convolutes it, if you will, with uh, the other one, which is kind of like a temporary license. So um, that everybody would come in on a, on a provisional license. And that in order for you then to move to a standard or professional, you would have to complete and participate in a Montana teacher mentorship program. And then once you complete that program, uh, then, you, uh, then you could move into second tier or third tier. So the question becomes then, do we put, is that, so I think the question becomes is this, do we want to make completing of a Montana teacher mentorship program, a requirement to get a standard or professional license? I think that's the question. So it's not like you could come in on um, the, you would, everybody would be on that first tier, whether you had a job or not. And so there's not a time frame like the provisional license, if you will, where there's three years. It's just, you would stay on that until you actually had the mentorship. I don't know if I'm making any sense, so you guys well, can give me a little are, indication Julie. here, check for understanding there. But it's, Thanks, it's, a little bit un, it's a little bit unclear what the task force is talking about too, because you know what Christine is saying is we could add this over here, right? I could copy this and put it over here as well, um, meaning you'd have to have that done also to get to this license, but then, um, it, what what hasn't been discussed is the years of experience because again if you've got somebody who's 
got more than three years experience, do they also have to have the mentorship program? I think this is where it gets really muddy <laughs> is trying to think about what benefit does it hold and then what what barriers is it potentially put in place for licensing to just convolute things. Well, and I think what Shelly and I were asking is what's the incentive to move to the second tier? If the first tier is somewhere I can stay for my career, that doesn't resolve the task force wanting mentorship for early teachers, right? It, so unless you make a tier one, a short window of time and not renewable, then I could stay in that. So what's the incentive for me to do a mentorship and move to tier two um, if I can stay in one? But then we're also putting up barriers again that you know to maintain a license, you have to be in the classroom and, and so on, um, which some states do. Um, so I get that they want mentorship of initial teachers for second, third year teachers to retain those, but I'm not sure that this is accomplishing that goal. It seems like there are other ways to write that. I'm just not thinking of what it is right off the top of my head, but I don't know that I understand the incentive to go into tier two for anyone. Yeah, you could renew, you could renew, right, this um, provisional over and over again, right? Until you had that piece and you could be teaching. So you're right, Christine, like what's really the incentive? I think the other part of the question, you guys, that has been at the heart of the conversation over in the task force that we'd love some, some pieces on is, does teacher mentorship program actually live in chapter 57? Is that a condition that, that really, it lives already in 55? in chapter 55 accreditation, which is um, all school districts um, should be implementing a Montana teacher, like mentorship and induction in their schools districts to support their teachers. Um, and so really, do we wanna make that a component that lives in chapter 57? I mean, does it make, I don't know. I mean, so this is, all right. So that would mean if you don't get a, a, if you don't complete a, Mon a Montana teacher mentorship program, what does that mean for you? Does that mean you can't keep a license? Does it change the license? So Christine, you're looking at it as kind of what's the incentive to get it. My question is then how do you address it if they don't? What's the other side of that? What does that mean if you don't do that? That's what I, I think that's what you're asking. Yes, it looks like it's a barrier for licensure because the mentorship program should really be at the school level. They should be the ones doing the mentorship program. So for example, we have a mentorship program, but how do we get it in, approved by the state? And so they can move over and everything. And I think every, unless you have to do it through the state, I don't know what their view is on that, but I don't think it belongs here. I agree. I think it's, it feels like another mandate when a lot of schools already have these programs in place. And I would, I would pretty sure that it would be a one pager to uh, essentially certify what you're doing in your district back to OPI so that OPI would have a record of the substantive nature of whatever that program looked like. I also have the question about some of our rural schools that have so few teachers that what would a mentorship program even look like when you have one or two teachers essentially in your whole district. Um, and so I think uh, a lot more guidance on what exactly that would be entailing, um, as well as what outside resources OPI would be able to help provide for places where there is no senior teacher around um, and what that's going to encompass for them. So Christine, to your point, if you made this license two-year two -year license non-renewable, that, that gives the incentive then that you have to move to the next one, right? Just to your question. And I'm definitely not saying that I would agree with that, yeah. <laughs> but I'm just but that, saying right, right. now, if you're trying to get new teachers mentorship, I don't know that this language is accomplishing that. I was trying to find in 55 where the language about schools providing mentorship is. Anybody know off the top of their head where in 55? 
Yeah, I can find it for you. Just give me a second there, Christine. I mean, I have colleagues who feel very strongly about this, right? We're preparing educators to walk into that classroom, but we can't prepare them for everything that they're going to experience. And we need districts to mentor their new teachers. And many of them, um, as Scott mentioned, do a really good job of doing that. Um, and so that is in place and technically to get, um, you know, for K-12 schools to receive accreditation, they are supposed to have that program in place. But now, again, how do we document that? Who's signing off on that? What does that actually look like in practice? Um, is just an interesting layer of complexity in licensure rule. You're putting the burden of the mentorship on the individual teacher with the license instead of on the school district. Shelly, that's a point that was brought up in the task force is that that's really the only stipulation associated with licensure that is at, in some ways out of the individual control of the, of the teacher who's trying to get the license. Um, they, they have to, you know, you can enroll in a program, go through a program, pass the practice, do the years teaching, everything's sort of on the individual, but if this mentorship program requires really some other system to be set up uh, within the school district too, to, or through the EPPs, either one, but. So thank you for that input. That's certainly something we can take back. Uh, key point here really as written now, uh, out of state licenses, if they're if you're coming in in good standing, the state of Montana, the way it's written here is is going to say your license is is good in Montana. So it's it's really written now to offer reciprocity to out of state teachers as long as they're coming with a license that's good, right? Not expired. Um, how do we feel about that? We think that's a good thing. That also addresses an issue of military spouses, which has been much discussion reciprocity for military spouses, but it becomes not an issue if um, we, we think about all incoming licenses as being applicable. Could you scroll down just a second? I can't see all the rest of, okay, it just says three or less years. And then the second tier is three or more years. And it really needs to be more than three here, right? Because then we've got overlap. We've got overlap of three. So it's three or less, more than three is what it needs to read. So in your very first um, row where you talk about the program they completed, scroll up just a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you have completion of an accredited EPP. There are actually different rules about um, an accredited EPP and an EPP in 102 definitions. So if you're trying to go with something like Teach for America, which is not an accredited EPP per se, it's more of an EPP or the person I was dealing with that did a district-based program out of Texas. Um, right now, the way rule is currently written is they do qualify for a license if they have five years of experience, but right now the way you have this written is that they don't actually qualify. You're exactly right, and, but I we are looking at changing 102, the definition of accredited, to include state approved programs. So um, if they went through the Texas program that was approved by the state of Texas, then Montana will view that as accredited. We're looking at adjusting that definition. Uh, okay. We, have, we, haven't got the, we haven't got the language fully worked out yet, but the task force is looking at that same thing that it would be for TSA if it was, if that person was licensed, right? So they would need to be licensed in the state. It, it, just, it still creates difficulty for someone who, you know, 
if they didn't get a full license through TSA and then they try to come to Montana, they're still going to run into some difficulty. But if they got the full license in the other state, uh, that was a state approved program, then they come to Montana, then they'll be okay. Okay, thanks for that clarification. That had not been shared with us yet. And yeah, that language is not far enough along yet to share. And we're on, because a lot of this has to, is tied into it too, so. But it is on the radar. Another piece that uh, was recommended by the task force was if this third tier exists to grant um, that license to anybody who completed the national board certification progress or program, even if they didn't have a master's degree. Does the wording need to be um, instead of three or more years, more than three years there, just for the overlap? It does. Jacob, I think we got to look clearly at that language because if you have three years, you would qualify, not if you have three years and three months. So, um, so just want to look clearly at that language. Just thinking about like how we yeah, get so years of experience. This would be less than three. This that, that makes it work. And this would be three or more, right? Bear with me. I'm just going to make a note here. We need to look at that to make sure it's clear. So we have about a half hour left. The other conversation that's really taking place is around endorsements. And currently to add an endorsement in Montana, you need to go back to a program of study, which means going back to a university setting to obtain the take classes in the endorsement area. And compared to other states, uh, there are, you know, that's restrictive. Many states have other options to obtain endorsements. So we've, we've put forth some potential options for consideration. We have not had a chance to really dig into this discussion yet. Um, the options would be, as currently written, complete an approved program of study. Uh, another option could be to simply pass the praxis in the endorsement area that you wish to obtain. A third option could be three years full-time experience teaching in the endorsement area. Uh, this is a specific one if you think about accreditation. So at, the school, at a school level, you could put someone into a position, say teaching math, uh, you would be out of accreditation because that person would be teaching out of the area. But at the end of three years, which would be before you uh, really got into accreditation trouble, got on the bad list, I like to say, uh, if they did that for three years and that teacher was demonstrated competency, then they could obtain that, uh, that endorsement. And then you would, you would no longer be out of accreditation. Uh, it also gives as a, a district level evaluator, if you see that person's not competent in that position, then 
uh, it would demonstrate that they would not need that endorsement because it would not be an effective place for that person to teach. And then the fourth option could be 60 hours of approved professional development activity in the endorsement area. From a district level, in terms of adding endorsements, what, uh, what would be beneficial from our district level folks who are on the call? Are you asking for like uh, fields of study? Well, just about this, Scott, like would this be beneficial uh, for you if you had people who need to add endorsements? Would any of these be useful? Do you think any of these would not be sufficient to demonstrate someone who you'd want to have an endorsement? Um, are you in favor of these, not in favor? Really just open discussion about what could be the different options added to demonstrate competency so that teachers could add endorsements to their licenses. It's just interesting that we like the praxis sometimes and we hate the praxis sometimes. All right, we don't want it but now we wanna use it for this purpose, but we don't like it because we don't think it's an accurate measure of some, if someone's a good teacher or not, but now we wanna use it. So that's just my little side comment. Um, well, we don't want to, it's just an option. It's just, <laughs> no, nobody said we want to, it's just there as an option. Yeah, I mean, I, I've had this conversation. I, you know, I talked a little bit with Crystal before because I know the group has looked at that. And I think my personal opinion is it should not be across the board. Um, for all endorsement areas. I just, you know, so I'm talking with a family and consumer science teacher who wants elementary ed, yet they could take an elementary praxis of one and a half hour and do they really have everything they need to teach reading and math and science and social studies for kindergarten through eighth grade by taking that test. So I think we need to be aware of um, how we would approach that and would it vary by endorsement area, which I think happens in most states. Um, so are we not okay with adding elementary that way, but maybe if I'm science, if I'm biology and wanna add broad field, that's okay. So what does that look like? Um, but across the board, take the praxis, that's concerning to me because I've, I've sat on the praxis working committee at the state level with the EPPs and the OPI, um, for a lot of years and I've pretty much reviewed all of those tests. And I'm not a super good test taker, but the majority of them I could pass. Um, so should I be teaching that based on that? I don't know, but I think we need to be pretty aware of um, the limitations of some of these tests for particular subject areas. Um, you know, and, and does that prepare you enough for that particular area? Maybe based on your background, maybe not based on your background, but I'd like to see it. Um, you know, a conversation about not across the board for all content areas, which I think is what most states do. So Christine, um, when you bring that up, are you, you're thinking a little bit, you got to explore that a little bit more in depth. Like if somebody already has a secondary license then and an endorsement in a secondary license, then maybe. But if you have a, um, you know, if you have a secondary license and want to go to elementary, no. Or if you have an elementary, you can't just go to high school. I, I don't know. You're just saying, think about that a little bit more in detail I'm just saying, around. Yeah. I'm okay. just saying, think about that a little bit more because there are things that seem to be bigger stretches to me than other things with higher stakes um, than other things. So if I was trained, you know, I was a social, a social studies, um, secondary social studies teacher. Am I really prepared by taking one test that has a teeny tiny component and that's the thing if we look at elementary and you know there's 30 questions on reading instruction for example and so if i answer those 30 and i guess correctly am i really prepared to move into kindergarten and teach reading so i just think the stakes are pretty high in some of these areas and some of those transitions as opposed to um, others which seem a little bit more straightforward And because this is just all on the record, I will go on the record to say that I, I 
the 60 hours of professional development, what does that even look like? What are the regulations about that? What does that entail? Who's teaching those courses? That becomes um, an interesting question to define. Is it anything that meets renewal unit activities or is it more specific? I know they went into that with chapter um, four language with some of the CTE and, and what can meet those definitions for CTE of professional development and what cannot. But. Any other thoughts? Well, I'm especially with Christina on the last point about that 60 hours and, and what all that qualification aspects are within that. So I think some further definition with that would be helpful. As well as, I mean, are there state guided ones that could fit that bill? So I guess maybe a couple examples of how that could be done would be helpful in that spot. I also had the question about that need for full-time teaching because um, I think there like some middle school situations where somebody may be picking up a class does it have to be full-time and why, why are we putting that requirement in there? I think I think the language is more about like you just didn't teach a half a year, um, right? Um, so three years of experience could be sufficient to say. Um, I think you bring up a good point. It's not that you're. It's that you. You, for the entirety of three years, you taught in the endorsement area. Okay. So Jacob, this is Julie. Um, the the uh years of experience is actually defined in chapter 57 102 under 14 year of teaching experience means employment as a licensed teacher at any level within a state accredited p12 school system or in an educational institution specified in um, montana code for the equivalent of at least 0.5 fte for a school year comparable to a 180 day school year. So it is defined there just for reference. Okay. Yeah, that, cause I just think about, you know if we had somebody who was teaching, um, they were certified for science, um, but they were picking up like a math class too that, that we needed somebody to do that after three years of teaching that well, then we could do that, even though they taught just one out of their five classes was math. Now they could teach more math. So I like that. The interesting part about the three years of experience is that you're you are kind of setting your districts up to take a deviation on their current or on their accreditation per how rule is written right now, right? That's why they look at provisional license for those folks. That's why they look at internships for those people. But now it's just like, well, go ahead and have them teach it. And then at the end of three years, your deviation will be resolved. This is interesting to set your districts up in that way. And okay, so what if they have someone do it for two years? Oh, okay, now let's have someone else do it for another two years and another two years and another two years and really, they've never resolved the issue of finding an appropriately licensed teacher. They've just been jumping around within that. So just a couple points about that. If there's not a mechanism for someone to work toward that other than the district taking a deviation, that doesn't necessarily seem right either. Yeah, 
if they did such a thing, then that would also affect their overall accreditation because after so many years of having somebody teaching without the proper endorsement, uh, I think Jacob called it the bad list uh, group. And so that would put them in there. So this is a possible uh, stepping stone towards that, that it's a step towards the bad list, but you aren't necessarily on there unless you uh, jump around like you just suggested, Christine. Am I correct in that, Jacob? No, I'm not an expert in chapter 55. That's my understanding. It's, it, it, is, it is a gateway to a deviation, but it also is an incentive to get out of deviation because then at the end of the three years, that person could become, gain the endorsement, which would take that deviation away. Is how how I think about it. Uh, and if they jumped around, then you're right, Shay. They would stay in deviation and never never fix the issue. Mm. But it's also if this was if this was in place, it's important to note that Chapter 55, of course, is under revision as well. So this would sort of come out first, and then Chapter 55 could react as, uh, to it to make adjustments where necessary. Uh, around this. I know we have a hard time defining successful teaching experience, um, but that would be interesting to me, right? Because they could reach the end of the three years, have taught at it, a district doesn't renew them or moves them out of it because they suck at it, but they've met their three years and now they can become somebody else's problem. Um, I don't know, I would just put a little bit more thought into that. <clears throat> you could even consider some combination, right? Of experience plus the praxis. It doesn't always have to be an or or an or, you know, in there. But that would just, we've had trouble defining successful experience before. Um, but three years doesn't mean you were good at it and therefore should be licensed in it. It just means you had three years. I'm with you, Christine. I, I would be interested if we had some kind of a, a measure for growth and actually showing student growth across the year. Um, and that would then be maybe on the district that if you have somebody outside of a license area, you need some kind of pre-test, post-test for the year to show that they learned something from this unendorsed teacher and that it's uh, a sustainable amount that even though they aren't endorsed, we're still getting some good learning happening in their classroom. But I'm not sure what the proper measuring tool could be for that. Yeah, I think those are all <laughs> excellent considerations. The another key consideration is that the hope, <laughs> and this is a big hope, that um, a school leader would not allow someone who was not effective in two consecutive years to move into a third year. Um, but again, uh, there's that piece of just fill, you know just filling the position. And then they, be, you know, maybe they become someone else's problem at the district level too. Yeah, I guess. Um, you know, as Shay was getting at, what at the end of that three years, you know, is there any sort of documentation other than they, they did it for three years, but they knew what they were doing? And I guess that's kind of when you look at completed and appro approved program of study, you know, there's um, transition points throughout that program that determines if they can move on. Even if you look at the praxis, that's one measure of do they know somewhat content you know, what is it other than that they were just thrown in, um, ex you know, and got experience? 
what other measure is there to show that they know what they're doing? I guess it is the district hiring them in theory. Um, but even in the provisional license, right, the initial licensure, we have checkpoints before they can move on. What is the checkpoint other than years of experience here? So. Like a district recommendation, maybe? I don't know. I don't know what that looks like. And can you tell sometimes I can play devil's advocate? <laughs> I can ask. I can ask right. a lot of questions sometimes without having, no, having an a, answer, but just things to think about. That's a good point. I mean, if you add the district recommendation on there, then the, somebody at the district is saying, yes, we think this is a good idea. Uh, you know, to play devil's advocate to that point, you know, there's nothing that says anybody who completes an approved program of study is actually going to be effective either. So, um, well, you, you can, I, yes and no. I mean, there are, we have standards that they have to meet, benchmarks that they have to meet. I mean, that's why we go through state accreditation is to show what they do and what the data shows that they actually can teach in these areas, but I'll get off that soapbox. But just to make the point, I, I, the 60 hours of approved professional development to me is is pretty concerning without it, without defining that. Who approves that? Who defines it? Other thoughts or comments before we move to wrap up? So there are two more meetings of the task force. Is there anything that this group has not yet had a chance to bring up that they think is essential that needs to be taken back to the task force? in addition to what we've talked about today. Okay, well, we will take all of this feedback back to them. Um, the schedule for the task force is to wrap up the recommendations related to what we see here on this Thursday, uh, initiate a conversation about class four and class eight to be moved into the next Thursday to finalize that as well as what we looked at in chapter six and any adjustments in chapter one uh, that may cascade from these changes in terms of definitions uh, as well with everything being wrapped up by the end of, um, what is it, is it the first, October 1st, is that the Thursday, uh, be wrapped up by then, and recommendations moving forward to the, to the superintendent who would review and put forth her recommendations then. Will we have a chance to see, kind of we've been talking about pieces, will we have, will we have the opportunity to see the full document with strike throughs and edits that's moving forward to the superintendent? Will that be shared with the groups? I think Julia's left. Crystal, are you on? That's a question for you. So currently we do have the red lines up on the chapter 57 public website that exists. Um, my assumption is that whatever is final will also be placed up there for everybody to see. And that, that site is linked through the OPI main site. But can we make a note to just get clarification out to the feedback group as to what that will look like, Crystal or Virginia? Yes, um, they should have access to it since the feedback groups have like a drop down in that. Um, but I will be sure if they don't that they do and where to find the red lines there so that they'll we'll keep updating them as we add them. Yes. So, Crystal, is that in the Google Drive yep. that we present? 
the okay. Google site, not site. the drive. Okay. It's got like a pink heading to it. And I can include the link in the meeting minutes today. Uh, also on the OPI website, if you do um, use that homepage um, for the task forces, the agendas um, have the links to the, uh, to the Google site documents, but I can include it again today. Thank you. Jacob just put it in the chat and this is what it looks like. Um, and so if you see at the top, that red line recommendations is where we're, we're storing them. If there's nothing else, we want to thank everybody for all of your input. It's it's very helpful to be able to talk through the language and have another set of eyes for sure look at things uh, outside of the task force. So we will be sure and take all of this feedback back to them. It will be exceptionally helpful and we'll give you updates as we move along. I see Julie, you just came back. Anything you need to say before we wrap up? No, um, thank you, Jacob. Uh, appreciate all the feedback and being able to um, hear the feedback today. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.